Here on Your Brain on Facts, I may not have all the answers, but if your question is how can I find a sponsor for my small podcast, I do have the only answer you need. Podcorn. Podcorn is a marketplace that connects podcasters and businesses, many of them small businesses, to create ad campaigns that work for both parties. This is not a situation where you're going to have to have 25,000 downloads per episode before anyone will even look at you. Podcorn is easy to use, free to set up, you retain all of the rights to your podcast and everything else, and you get to tailor the ad campaign in a way that works for you and the sponsor, whether it's a host-read ad or an interview. You can get started today by going to podcorn.com. It's like popcorn, but for podcasts, podcorn.com. Late summer, 1990. The protest had been going on for two months. Tensions were escalating. Soldiers had been dispatched to enforce the government's will. But the Kanawaki Mohawk weren't going to give up another inch of their land. 14-year-old Juanique and her four-year-old sister, Kanatio, were there with their activist mother when violence erupted. Juanique tried to get little Tio to safety when she saw a soldier who had taken her school books from her weeks prior, and he stabbed her in the chest. My name's Moxie, and this is your Brain on Facts. One of my goals with this podcast is to tell the stories that don't get told, the stories of people of color and women. It's not always easy. Pick a topic to research, and I guarantee you, it's white men all the way down. But even when I haven't been struggling with my chronic idiopathic pulmonary condition, as I've been for the past three acute months, I've dropped the ball on that. Mea culpa. So let me try to catch up a little bit here as we close out November and Native American Heritage Month. And since my lungs are still playing up a bit, I'm tagging in past Moxie to help though I've done what I can to fix up her audio. Sadly, I have to work from the finished recordings, as I lost a hundred episodes worth of work files when I changed computers and deleted the hard drive on my right rather than the hard drive on my left. You've probably cottoned on already that today's episode isn't going to be a knee-slapping snark fest. But the severity of these stories is the precise reason they need to be told, especially the ones that happened relatively recently, but are treated like a vague paragraph in an elementary school history textbook. Come with me now to the 1960s and the edge of California, to a rocky island in San Francisco Bay. Yep, that one. The Rock. Alcatraz. After the American Indian Center in San Francisco was destroyed by a fire in October of 1969, an activist group called Indians of All Tribes turned their sights to Alcatraz Island and the prison which had closed six years earlier. A small group of activists, led by Mohawk college student Richard Oakes, went out to the island on November 9th, but they were only there for one night before authorities removed them. That didn't disappoint Oakes who told the San Francisco Chronicle, If a one-day occupation by white men on Indian land years ago established squatters' rights, then the one-day occupation of Alcatraz should establish Indian rights to the island. Eleven days later, a much larger group of Indians of all tribes members, a veritable occupation force of 89 men, women, and children, sailed to the island in the dead of night and claimed Alcatraz for all North American natives. Despite warnings from authorities, the IAT set up house in the old guards' quarters and began liberally, vibrantly redecorating, spray-painting the foreboding gray walls with flowers and slogans like Red Power and Custer Had It Coming. And of course I put pictures for that in the Vodacast app. Have you checked it out yet? I'm still getting the hang of my end of it, but it is going to be an amazing podcast listening app, especially if you like history and trivia and nonfiction podcasts. It allows me to put pictures and additional resources up, so if you're keen to listen and learn more, 
It's all right there in one app. And you can download it for Android and iPhone right now. Vodacast, V-O-D-A-C-A-S-T. Bonus fact, General George Armstrong Custer was well known for his curly, shoulder-length blonde hair. But even he must have known that he picked a fight he couldn't win, because the night before what would be his last stand, he cut his hair off so that the enemy wouldn't recognize him to take his scalp. The Alcatraz water tower bore the message, peace and freedom, welcome, home of the free Indian land. The IAT not only had a plan, they had a manifesto, addressed to the Great White Father and all his people, in which they declared their intention to use the island for a school, cultural center, and museum. Alcatraz was theirs, they claimed, by right of discovery, though the manifesto did offer to buy the island for $24 in glass beads and red cloth, the price supposedly paid for the island of Manhattan. Rather than risk PR fallout, the Nixon administration opted to just leave the occupiers alone as long as things remained peaceful, and just kind of wait the situation out. The island didn't even have potable water. How long could they stay there? Well, joke's on you, politicians of 50 years ago, because many of the occupiers had lived in conditions as bad on the reservations. They'd unknowingly been training for this moment their entire lives. Native Americans, college students, and activists swarmed the island, and the population ballooned to more than 600, twice the official capacity of the prison. They formed a governing body and set up a school for the kids, a communal kitchen, a clinic, and a security detail called the Bureau of Caucasian Affairs. Other activists helped move people and supplies to the island, and supportive well-wishers from all over sent money, clothes, and canned food. Government officials would periodically travel to the island to repeatedly try and fail to negotiate. The Indians of all tribes would settle for nothing less than the deed to Alcatraz Island and the government maintained that such a property transfer was literally impossible. The occupation was going better than anyone had expected, at least for the first few months. Then, many of the initial wave of residents had to go back to college or to their regular life, and their places were taken by people who were more interested in no rent and free food than helping any cause. Drugs and alcohol, which had been banned, were soon prevalent. Oakes and his wife would leave Alcatraz after his stepdaughter died in a fall, and things began to unravel even more quickly. In May, the sixth month of the occupation, the government dispensed with diplomatic efforts and cut the remaining electricity to Alcatraz. Only a few weeks later, a fire tore through the island and destroyed several buildings. Federal marshals removed the last occupiers in June the following year, an impressive 19 months after they first arrived. The remaining six men, five women, and four children. Unlike our other stories today, though, this time, when laws were passed after an act of rebellion, they were for the benefit of the rebels, with many states enacting laws for tribal self-rule and the federal government returning some of the land which had been taken over the years. When Alcatraz opened as a national park in 1973, not only had the graffiti from the occupation not been removed, much of it had been preserved as a part of the island's history and the history of Native Americans. And there are people who gather at Alcatraz every November for Un-Thanksgiving Day to celebrate Native culture and activism. Bad news has been coming at us fast and furious for, well, seemingly ever, but definitely for the past couple of years, this year being no exception. So it's not all that surprising that such a horrific news article as the discovery of 1,300 unmarked graves at four residential schools in Canada left the main news cycle very quickly. What is a residential school? And why are there graves at it? What happened in Canada was a lot like what happened in the U.S. when the American government took tens of thousands of children from Native families 
and place them in boarding schools with strict assimilation practices. Their philosophy? Kill the Indian to save the man. At that time, the beginning of the late 19th century, the government was still fighting Indian wars. There had been day and boarding schools on reservations prior to 1870, when U.S. Cavalry Captain Richard Henry Pratt established the Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. You heard mention of the Carlisle Indian School in episode 166 when I talked about Olympian Jim Thorpe. This school was not on a reservation, so as to further remove indigenous influences. The Carlisle School and other boarding schools were part of a long history of U.S. attempts to either kill, remove, or assimilate Native Americans. Since there was no more Western territory to push them towards, the U.S. decided to remove Native Americans by assimilating them. In 1885, Commissioner of Indian Affairs Hiram Price explained the logic. It is cheaper to give them education than to fight them. Off-reservation schools began their assault on Native cultural identity as soon as the students arrived by first doing away with all outward signs of tribal life the children brought with them. Long braids worn by boys were cut off. Native clothes were replaced with uniforms. The children were given new anglicized names, including new surnames. Traditional native foods were abandoned, as were things like sharing from communal dishes, forcing students to use the table manners of white society complete with silverware, napkins, and tablecloths. The strictest prohibition arguably fell on native languages. Students were forbidden from speaking their tribal language, even to each other. Some schools rewarded children who spoke only English, but most schools chose the stick over the carrot and relied on punishment to achieve this aim. This is especially cruel when you consider that many of the words the children were being forced to learn and use had no equivalent in their mother tongue. The Indian boarding schools taught history with a definite white bias. Columbus Day was heralded as a banner day in history and a beneficial event for Native people, as it was only after the discovery did Native Americans become part of history. Thanksgiving was a holiday to celebrate good Indians having aided the brave Pilgrim Fathers. On Memorial Day, some students at off-reservation schools were made to decorate the graves of soldiers sent to kill their fathers. Half of each school day was spent on industrial training. Girls learned to cook, clean, sew, care for poultry, and do laundry for the entire institution. Boys learned industrial skills like metalworking, shoemaking, or performed manual labor such as farming. Not receiving much funding from the government, the schools were required to be as self-sufficient as possible, so students did the majority of any work that had to be done. By 1900, school curriculums tilted even further toward industrial training while academics were neglected. The Carlisle School developed a placing out system, which put Native students in the mainstream community for a summer or a year at a time, with the official goal of exposing them to more job skills. A number of these programs were outright exploitative. At the Phoenix Indian School, girls became the major source of domestic labor for white families in the area, while boys were placed in seasonal harvest or other jobs that no one else wanted. Conversion to Christianity was also deemed essential to the cause. Curriculums included heavy emphasis on religious instruction, like the Ten Commandments, the Beatitudes, and Psalms. Sunday school meant lectures on sin and guilt. Christianity governed gender relations at the school, and most schools invested their energy in keeping them apart, in some cases, endangering the lives of students by locking girls in their dormitories at night. Discipline within the Indian boarding schools was severe and generally consisted of confinement, corporal punishment, or restriction of food. In addition to coping with the severe discipline, 
Students were ravaged by disease, exacerbated by crowded conditions. Tuberculosis, influenza, and trachoma, sore eyes, were the greatest threat. In December of 1899, measles broke out at the Phoenix Indian School, reaching epidemic proportions by January. In its wake, 325 cases of measles, 60 cases of pneumonia, and nine deaths were recorded in a 10-day period. During Carlisle's operation from 1879 to 1918, nearly 200 children died and were buried near the school. Naturally, Native people resisted the schools in various ways. Sometimes entire villages refused to enroll their children in white schools. Native parents also banded together to withdraw their children en masse, encouraging runaways and undermining the school's influence during summer breaks. In some cases, police were sent onto the reservations to seize children from their parents. The police would continue to take children until the school was filled, so sometimes orphans were offered up, or families would negotiate a family quota. It was not until 1978, within the lifetime of many of my gentle listeners, that the passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act, that Native American parents gained the legal right to deny their children's placement in off-reservation schools. Though the schools left a devastating legacy, they failed to eradicate Native American culture as they'd hoped. Later, the Navajo code talkers who helped the U.S. win World War II would reflect on the strange irony this forced assimilation had played in their lives. As adults, the code talkers found it puzzling that the same government that had tried to take away their language in schools later gave them a critical role speaking their languages in military service, recounts the National Museum of the American Indian. Without speaking to its historical accuracy, I'd love to recommend, if you can find it, the movie The Education of Little Tree, starring James Cromwell, Tantu Cardinal, and personal favorite Graham Greene, about a part Cherokee boy who goes to live with his grandparents in the mountains of Tennessee, but is taken from them and put in an Indian boarding school. There are a number of off-reservation boarding schools still in operation today. Life in the schools is strict, but now includes teaching native culture and language rather than suppressing it. Though they cannot separate from their legacy of oppression and cultural violence, for many modern children, these schools are a step to a better life. Poverty is endemic to many reservations, which also see much higher than average rates of alcoholism, drug use, and suicide. For the students, these schools are a chance to escape all that. Don't worry, there's no ad break here. That would be kind of tacky, given the topic matter. I just need a minute to catch my breath. On the night of March 27, 1973, Marlon Brando won the Oscar for Best Actor for The Godfather. Amid the gaudy evening wear, 26-year-old Sasheen Littlefeather mounted the stage in stark contrast in her tasseled buckskin dress, moccasins, long, straight black hair, such a contrast that it beggared belief. Liv Ullman read the name of the winner, and Roger Moore made to hand Little Feather Brando's Oscar, but she held out a polite, forbidding hand. She explained that Brando would not accept the award because of the treatment of American Indians today by the film industry. Some people applauded. A lot of them booed. But Little Feather kept her calm. Here, you can listen for yourself. Marlon Brando in The Godfather. Accepting the award for Marlon Brando and The Godfather, Miss Shasheen Little Feather. Hello. My name is Sasheen Littlefeather. I'm Apache, and I'm president of the National Native American Affirmative Image Committee. I'm representing Marlon Brando this evening, and he has asked me to tell you 
in a very long speech, which I cannot share with you presently because of time, but I will be glad to share with the press afterwards that he very regretfully cannot accept this very generous award. And the reasons for this being are the treatment of American Indians today by the film industry, excuse me, and on television in movie reruns, and also with recent happenings at Wounded Knee. At the time, Wounded Knee in South Dakota was the site of a month-long standoff between Native American activists and U.S. authorities, sparked by the murder of a Lakota man. I beg at this time that I have not intruded upon this evening, and that we will, in the future, our hearts and our understandings will meet with love and generosity. Thank you on behalf of Marlon Brando. We're used to this sort of thing now, but on the night, nobody knew what to make of this heartfelt plea in the middle of a night of movie industry mutual masturbation. Was it art? A prank? Some people said Little Feather was a hired actress, that she was Mexican rather than Apache, or, because people suck on several levels at once, that she was a stripper. We have to go back to go forward to explain how this remarkable moment came to pass. Little Feather's life was no cakewalk. Her father was Native American and her mother was white, but both struggled with mental illness. Little Feather had to be removed from their care at age three, suffering from tuberculosis of the lungs that required her to live in an oxygen tent in the hospital. She was raised by her maternal grandparents, but saw her parents regularly. That would initially sound like a positive, but it exposed her to domestic violence. She once tried to defend her mother from a beating by hitting her father with a broom. He chased her out of the house and tried to run her down with his truck. The young girl escaped into a grove of trees and spent the night in the branches of one, crying herself to sleep. She didn't fit in at the white Catholic school her grandparents sent her to. At age 12, she and her grandfather visited the historic Roman Catholic Church, Carmel Mission, where she was horrified to see the bones of a Native American person on display in the museum. I said, this is wrong. This is not an object. This is a human being. So I went to the priest and I told him God would never approve of this. And he called me a heretic. I had no idea what that was. An adolescence of depression and a struggle for identity followed. Fortunately, in the late 60s and early 70s, Native Americans were beginning to reclaim their identities and reassert their rights. After her father died when she was 17, Little Feather began visiting reservations and even visited Alcatraz during the Indians of All Tribes occupation. She traveled around the country learning traditions and dances and meeting other what she called urban Indian people, also reconnecting with their heritage. The old people who came from different reservations taught us young people how to be Indian again. It was wonderful. By her early 20s, Little Feather was head of the local Affirmative Action Committee for Native Americans, studying representation in film, television, and sports. They successfully campaigned for Stanford University to remove their offensive Indian mascot 50 years prior to pro sports teams like the Cleveland Indians getting wise. At the same time, white celebrities like Burt Lancaster began taking a public interest in Native American affairs. Little Feather lived near director Francis Ford Coppola, but she only knew him to say hello. Nonetheless, after hearing Marlon Brando speaking about Native American rights, as she walked past Coppola's house, she found him sitting on the front porch drinking iced tea. She yelled up the walk, Hey, you directed Marlon Brando in The Godfather. And she asked him for Brando's address so she could write him a letter. It took some convincing, but Coppola gave up the address. Then... Nothing. Not for months. 
But then the phone rang at the radio station where she worked. The male caller said, I bet you don't know who this is. No, I'm not going to do a Brando impression. Are you kidding me? She said, sure I do. Sure as hell took you long enough to call. They talked for about an hour, then called each other regularly. Before long, he was inviting her on the first of several visits, and they became friends. That's how Brando came to appoint Little Feather to carry his message to the Oscars, but the whole thing was hastily planned. Half an hour before her speech, she'd been at Brando's house on Mulholland Drive, waiting for him to finish typing an eight-page speech. She arrived at the ceremony with his assistant minutes before the best actor was being announced. The producer of the show immediately informed her she would be removed from stage after 60 seconds. And then it all happened so fast when it was announced that he had won. I promised Marlon that I would not touch the statue if he won. And I promised the producer that I would not go over 60 seconds. So there were two promises I had to keep. As a result of all that, she had to improvise. Now, I'm not burdened with an abundance of good things to say about Marlon Brando. He really could have had a place in the Mixed Bags of History chapter in the Your Brain on Facts book, audiobook available most places now. But he had Hollywood dead to rights on its Native American stereotypes and treatment, as savages and nameless cannon fodder, often played by white people in red face. Couldn't even give him the job. Now, this was a message not everyone was ready to hear. John Wayne, who killed uncountable fictional natives in his movies, was standing in the wings at that fateful moment and had to be bodily restrained by security to stop him from charging Little Feather. For more on Wayne's views of people of color, Google his 1971 Playboy interview. Clint Eastwood, who presented the Best Picture Oscar, also for The Godfather, said, I don't know if I should present this award on behalf of all the cowboys shot in all the John Ford westerns over the years. In case you thought fussing out an empty chair was the worst that we got from him. When Little Feather got backstage, people made stereotypical war cries and tomahawk motions at her. After talking to the press, and I can't say I'm not surprised the event organizers didn't spirit her away immediately, She went back to Brando's house where they sat together and watched the reactions on TV, the compulsory refreshing of your social media feed of the 1970s. But Little Feather is proud of the trail she blazed. She was the first woman of color and the first indigenous woman to use the Academy Awards platform to make a political statement. I didn't use my fist. I didn't use swear words. I didn't raise my voice but I prayed that my ancestors would help me. I went up there like a warrior woman. I went up there with the grace and the beauty and the courage and the humility of my people. I spoke from my heart. Her speech drew international attention to Wounded Knee, where U.S. authorities had essentially imposed a media blackout. Sachi Littlefeather went on to get a degree in holistic health and nutrition become a health consultant to Native American communities across the country, worked with Mother Teresa caring for AIDS patients in hospices, and led the San Francisco Kateri Circle, a Catholic group named after Kateri Tekakwita, the first Native American saint canonized in 2012. Little Feather is now one of the elders transmitting knowledge down generations, though sadly probably not for much longer. She has breast cancer that's metastasized to her lung. When I go to the spirit world, I am going to take all these stories with me. But hopefully, I can share some of these things while I'm here. I'm going to the world of my ancestors. I've earned the right to be my true self. Some words are visceral reminders of collective historic trauma. Selma, or Kent State, recall the civil rights movement and the use of military force against civilians. Bloody Sunday evokes the troubles of Northern Ireland. Within indigenous communities in North America, the word is Oka. That word reminds them of the overwhelming Canadian response to a small demonstration in a dispute over Mohawk land in Quebec. 
Over the course of three months, the Canadian government sent 2,000 police, 4,500 soldiers, that's an entire brigade, backed with armored vehicles, helicopters, even the Navy somehow, to subdue several small Mohawk communities. What was at stake? What was worth all this to the government? A golf course and some condos. The Kunisitake had been fighting for their land for centuries, trying to do it in accordance with the white man's laws, as far back as appeals to the British government in 1761. In 1851, the Governor General of Canada refused to recognize their right to their land. Eight years later, that land was given to the Suplicians, a Catholic diocese. In 1868, the government of the nascent Dominion of Canada denied that the Mohawks' original land grant had even reserved land for them, so it wasn't covered under the Indian Act. In the 1910s, the Mohawk of Kanesatake appealed all the way to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, Canada's highest appeals court at the time, who ruled that official title to the land was held by the Suplicians. By the end of the Second World War, the Suplicians had sold all of their remaining land and had left the area. Surely the Mohawk could have their land back now? Nope. The Mohawk were now confined to about 2.3 square miles or 6 square kilometers, known as the Pines, less than one-tenth of the land they once held. The Kanesatake, along with the Kanawake and the Aguasasani, asserted Aboriginal title to their ancestral land in 1975, but their claim was rejected for the most bullsh** reason possible, that they had not held the land continuously from time immemorial, and on and on. So you can understand why they'd be a little miffed when plans were announced to expand a golf course that had been built in 1961, expanding onto land that was used for sacred and ceremonial purposes and included a graveyard. Not a burial ground. Why is it when it's native people, we always say burial ground. If it's anyone else, we call it a graveyard. Well, this is a graveyard, standing headstones and everything. There's a graveyard, a family graveyard at the edge of my property. My house is 200 years old. And I would not dream of putting a putting green on top of the Frasers, and they've been dead for 175 years. My semantic ranting aside, the Mohawks again tried to use the proper legal channels and again got royally screwed over. In March of 1990, protests and petitions they had organized were ignored by the city council in Oka. They had to do something the city couldn't ignore. On March 10th, 1990, oh hey, that's my birthday, the day, not the year, after Oka's municipal council voted to proceed with the golf course expansion, a small group of Mohawks barricaded the access road. With a building, they drug a fishing shack into the pines and topped it with a banner that read, are you aware that this is Mohawk territory? And the same in French because Quebec. There's a picture on the Vodacast app, naturally, as well as a photo called Face to Face of Canadian Private Patrick Cloutier and Warrior Brad LaRock practically nose to nose staring each other down. I'm told it's an absolutely iconic photo in Canadian history. And of course, if that's wrong, hit me up on social media, Facebook and Instagram, your brain on facts, Twitter, brain on facts pod. Hey, I'm on TikTok because I have to be at Moxie LaBouche. And that image should really be more famous outside of Canada like the lone protester blocking tanks in Tiananmen Square, or the 1968 Summer Olympics where Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised black power fists during the award ceremony. The township of Oka tried to get a court injunction to order its removal. On July 1, 1990, the Quebec Provincial Police sent a large, heavily armed force of tactical officers armed with assault rifles to dismantle the blockade. The Mohawks met this show of force with a show of their own. Behind the peaceful protesters, warriors stood ready. As the stalemate dragged on, the mayor of Oka tried repeatedly to get injunctions to have the barrier removed, and the Kanesatake Mohawk reached out to natives in other communities. Sympathy protests were held, 
and people came from other communities to join their fight. And they brought with them supplies like camping gear, means of communication, equipment, food, and weapons, naturally. And it's a good thing they did resupply because leaving the protest to go through the town of Oka, even to get food, the natives faced not only verbal harassment from the white townspeople, but they threw rocks at them as well. The protesters were a complete cross-section of society, men, women, children of various ages. They manned the barricade and ran the day-to-day -day organization, while the warrior society stood ready. It's difficult to pin down exactly who was in the warrior society. Leadership tended to change based on the circumstances, and any member roles, if they existed, were a closely kept secret. What we do know is that many or most of the warriors were veterans, with a particular persistence of Vietnam Marines. Why the warriors exist is a much easier question to answer. The tipping point came when the Mohawk closed off the Mercier Bridge, sparking a traffic nightmare. Provincial police arrived at dawn on July 11th and told the Mohawks they had until 8 o'clock to clear out. The natives stood their ground. Because, because of a few people that, were, that initiated this whole thing, I mean, I mean the non-Indians, that, that initiated this project of a golf course and then, and then trying to take the land away. Because it, it's Mohawk land, it's our land. There's a little bit left. They're sucking the marrow out of our bones. That's, that's obviously what they, they all want. They want everything. Just before nine o'clock, provincial police lobbed tear gas and stun grenades into the protesters. A 20 minute gun battle ensued. Dozens of rounds of ammunition were shot off. We kept talking to them saying, you know, what kind of people are you? There's children here and you're shooting tear gas at us. We're, not, we're unarmed and you're aiming your weapons at us. What kind of people are you? And the inevitable happened when you're shooting dozens of rounds of ammo. A provincial police SWAT officer was hit in the face and subsequently died. With that, the provincial police retreated leaving so quickly they left behind four squad cars, two vans, and a front-end loader. Kind of a bulldozer-y kind of thing. The natives took what was useful from the vehicles, crushed them with the loader, and made a new barricade, blocking off Highway 344. The Mohawk braced for a counterattack and vowed to fire back three bullets for every bullet fired at them. The Canadian government called the Royal Canadian Armed Forces to deal with the Mohawk. As the army pushed further into the Mohawk stronghold, soldiers and warriors were getting increasingly in one another's faces. The warriors would taunt the soldiers, telling them to put down their weapons and fight them hand to hand. The rest of the siege would play out with no further gunfire, though that's not to say no violence. As the siege wore on, most of the remaining warriors, as well as some of the women and children, took refuge in a nearby residential treatment center. Thankfully, unlike a lot of other protests or actions of native people versus governments, it wasn't a mass slaughter that brought things to the end. After a community meeting, it was the Mohawk women who decided they would walk out peacefully, ending the siege. With military helicopters flying low, spotlights glaring down at them, and soldiers pointing guns in their faces, they tried to calmly exit the standoff area. It worked okay for the women, not great for the warriors, who were immediately assaulted by the police. Fifty people were taken away from the warrior camp, including 23 warriors. But that means right over half the people taken into custody were non-combatants. By 9.30 that night, the army began to pull out, and the two-and-a-half-month siege was at an end. A number of warriors were brought up on charges, and five were convicted of crimes including assault and theft, but only one served any jail time. Investigations were held and revealed problems with the way the provincial police handled the situation, you think? that included command failures and racism in the ranks. During the standoff, the Canadian federal government purchased the Pines in order to prevent further development, officially canceling the expansion of the golf course and the condominiums. 
but you've been around the block a couple times. You know how this, the good news is, thing works. As of now, the government has never transferred that land over to the Mohawk people. And that's where we run out of ideas, at least for today. Rather than being taken to the hospital for a stab wound a centimeter from her heart, Monique and dozens of other protesters were taken into custody. Thankfully, she would heal just fine and even went on to become an Olympic athlete and continued her activism. And little Tio? She grew up to be an award-winning actress, best known in our house for playing Tannis on Letterkenny. Season 10 premiere watch party, anyone? Remember, you can always find the source links and the script at yourbrainonfacts.com. Thanks for spending part of your day with me, and stay safe.